Welcome to the Dr. Diamond Podcast, where doctors learn from industry experts proven methods to grow their practices like the top 1%. And now your hosts, President of OfficeAutomated.com, Robert Barton, and the CEO of New Patient Group, founder of the Dr. Diamond Club, national keynote speaker, and featured in Dental Economics, Forbes, and CNBC, Brian Wright. Riding solo today. Robert Barton will be joining us for a new podcast we will be doing next week. So it'll be good to get my co host back. It's been a while since we've done one. You know, the, the company is doing really well. We're growing quite a bit. Uh, what I find is, is I'm just traveling all over the place and I love it. You know, it, it's a great thing to get to wake up every single day and help people, uh, whether it be some of the staff members, some of the doctors, whatever it may be. It's just an awesome feeling. And so have some really great things going on with a lot of large companies out there uh, with partnerships, with just different things going on and really taking this company to to the next level. And it's so exciting, a lot of exciting things going on, but it also hampers, uh, you know, getting into the broadcast booth. It feels good being back in here, uh, talking to all of you out there, whether it be the the consistent avid listeners out there, or maybe this is the first time you've listened to a podcast. So uh, excited to be back and excited to be talking with you. Today we're going to talk about advanced telephone training and 15 ways to make your receptionist great. And a lot of these ways, you know, some of them is going to be, yeah, that that sounds pretty common sense, uh, but the other ones are going to be pretty advanced. And it's a lot of consumer stuff that you've heard us talk about. But the thing is, when you're a business owner, uh, it, you need to really, really remember this. You can't just throw a script in front of somebody and go, go do it. And a lot of times that's better than nothing, but too many business owners stop short of what is required based on science and what human brains, just how our brains are built, how we all learn. And a lot of this we're going to go into today is just really about how you take your receptionist, forget healthcare, how you take the receptionist inside your practice or inside your business to a Ritz Carlton type level. And I want every one of you out there to have employees that if they went and gave their resume to the Ritz-Carlton to do the equivalent of the exact same thing they do inside your practice. You, we've heard we talked about this before. We're going to talk about it more today. But think about it, guys. Listen to me very closely here. You know, your people have to be trained on five-star customer service. They have to know how to handle complaints properly at a high level. They have to know how to overcome objections. They have to know how to smile when they answer the phone. They have to have proper verbiage, tone. They have to understand the art of edification. And those are just a few things. They have to have sales fundamentals. Those are just a few things of the many, many commercial items that you trust your staff to do every single day, and today it relates to the receptionist, that they don't have training for. And it's perplexing. We talk about it all the time. You trust somebody to answer your phones that should be the ultimate sales advertising machine for your business. The person answering your phones is not an interviewer. They are not to sit on the phone and ask questions to the consumer, the potential new patient, to their blue in the face. Their job is to get on the phone, give a great experience, build an image in the consumer mind that you are the best in town, and get the heck off the phone. That is their job. They are to be your number one sales machine. The number one investment you will ever have in running a business is your receptionist. And far too often that gets overlooked. So let's talk about the first goal. The first goal is understanding what five-star customer service actually means. For those of you that listen to the show a lot, this is something you've heard us talk about probably to your blue in the face. You're probably going out there, oh, Brian, here we go again. I already know what the definition is. But I hope that's the case because that means the repetition of us talking about it, you now learn it, which means you can go apply that in your business or if you're a rep that works for a company out there that tries to get uh, practices to grow, it's going to help you if you know this. But your receptionist have to know, and this is where a script is not good enough. Your receptionist have to know 
the philosophies and the whys in order for them to carry out their job at a very high level. The very first one, understanding what five-star customer service actually means. Very misunderstood term. One of the most misunderstood terms in business. See, customer service is not you doing whatever your clientele wants or whatever your patients want or whatever your customers want. Whatever you call them, we've talked about this before, it's all the same. You can call it a patient, you can call it a client. They're an active paying person to your business, so they're a client. But it doesn't mean that your patients get whatever they want. That's not customer service. Five-star customer service is defined. Write this down. If you're in a place where you can write this down, I want you to do it. It's very important. Extremely important. This is You're about to be taught one of the best business lessons you can ever be taught, especially if you're a business-to-consumer organization. Of course it matters if you're a B2B business, business-to-business organization out there as well, but especially B2C. Because if you're able to master this, which very few companies are and very few employees are able to master it for their particular position within a business. If you're able to master it, your competition does not stand a chance. And five-star customer service means that you as a business, you as a practice, you as an organization, get whatever you want from your clientele, whatever you want from your patients. Meanwhile, your clientele, your patients, your customers believe They've received everything they've wanted from you. Now picture that in your head for just a second. Your business gets what it wants. Your patients get what they want. How does that happen? And one of the only ways it happens is through high-level verbiage, which we're going to get into more today. But it's one of the only ways it can happen, meaning that your verbiage in every type of situation has to be in a way that gets you what you want while making the consumer feel like they have received what they want. That is customer service. It's why a lot of doctors out there that are so scared to put a no-show policy in place and hold their patients accountable for it. There's so many doctors that are freaked out about it. Oh, I don't want to lose a patient, blah, blah, blah. If you're listening and that's your mindset, you don't understand five-star customer service. Just period in the story. Because unless your business wins, it's not customer service. And if only your patients win, it's not customer service. And if only your business wins, it's not customer service. It goes both ways. And the reason why that is the very first goal when you are training people on the telephones is if they don't understand the definition of what true five-star customer service is, a lot of the other phone training skills, the sales fundamentals, other things that we're going to be talking about today, it'll go in one ear and out the next because they won't understand the meaning. They don't understand the meaning of the dual close that we're going to talk about or other types of sales fundamentals. It's all about getting what you want as a business while ensuring your patients, your clients, your customers Believe they got what they wanted from you. That's what it is. And you should have every single employee in your organization memorize that. Because any idea you have, one of the first questions you should ask yourself is does that idea benefit our business and does it benefit whatever your clientele is? Again, clients, patients, customers, whatever you want to call them. Because if the answer isn't yes on both sides, it's not customer service, you can throw the idea in the toilet. Because all that leads into remembering, and this is goal number two, if you really want to have receptionists at the high level, if you really want to have a business at a high level, is understanding what marketing really means. Because remember, and this is a very misunderstood term, it's why you know I see all kinds of companies out there saying, hey, we're a practice management company. Or we're a staff training company. Whatever it is, you're a marketing company. This always drives me crazy. You're a marketing company. Every company in business to help other businesses grow is a marketing company. Because there's nothing that doesn't fall under the definition of marketing. Marketing 
And this is so important for you as a business owner to know. It's so important for your receptionist to know because literally they are your ultimate marketing machine. Marketing is anything that has a direct or indirect influence on how somebody perceives your business, indirect or direct. So if you're a company that helps design the toilets, guess what? You're a marketing company. If you're a company that paints walls, guess what? You're a marketing company. If you're a company that installs computers, you're a marketing company. If you're a company that has a practice management software, you're a marketing company. And you get the point. The, the, the list is endless. Everything is marketing. Hence our logo. Or our slogan to our logo, excuse me. Everything is marketing. There's not one thing you'll ever do that does not fall under the definition of marketing. Now, again, why it's so important for your receptionist to know this as well is they have to understand that every single word that comes out of their mouth has a direct or indirect influence on how that consumer perceives your business, your practice. Every word they speak, their body posture on the other end of the phone to where how they're coming across on the other line has a, to the consumer on the other line is very much related to their posture, to how they're sitting. Everything is marketing, and the receptionist has to have that embedded in their brain. Everything they do has a direct or indirect impact on your business and your success. Everything is marketing. So important. And that rolls us into goal number three is understanding how the human brain works. We talk about this on this podcast quite often, but it's so important that your receptionist knows this. They have to know this. The human brain works in photos. It works in images. If you didn't know that, you need to write that down and you need to ensure that your staff understands that, understands the fact that every word I'm speaking to you right now And every word that you'll ever hear for the rest of your life, your brain immediately, upon impact, flips that into a photo, into an image. Which means your people have to be fantastic with their verbiage. Because what is your receptionist? What image is your receptionist building with words coming out of their mouth in the mind of the consumer that knows little or nothing about you and a consumer that has choices, which we're going to get to here in a minute. See, all of this is a foundation of a philosophy of getting it through the head of the receptionist that it's far more than a script, far more than words on paper. All of this goes into making them great. And this is advanced stuff. This is not your typical healthcare consultant type of training. This is some advanced Ritz Carlton type stuff. The employees have to know the behind the scenes reasons, the philosophies of what you're trying to accomplish. They have to feel proud in a sense of greatness about their job. I'm not just a receptionist. I'm all these things. I'm a five-star customer service expert. I'm a marketing expert. I should be the number one marketing machine that this practice, this business ever hires. And then because every word I say either builds the proper image or detracts from the proper image, I have to be great. And that's what's the edification, the art of bragging. So, so very important, the art of bragging. If you are unable to properly brag about why you are the place to be, why the staff's great, why the doctor's great, why the experience is great, how it's superior to everybody else in town, if you can't properly articulate that stuff, explain to me how a consumer is going to know whether or not to come see you. How do they know you're better? How do they know you're better? Because remember, consumers don't get what you get. They don't value what you value either. So you've got to be able to speak their language in a way 
that builds that photo image in the brain to get them to go, you know what, this is the place to be. Has to happen. It has to happen. And it doesn't. We've been doing mystery calls for years, and 99% of them, actually higher, I'd say 99.9% if I had to put money on it. There is not one word that comes out of the receptionist's mouth. And by the way, if you're a doctor listening out there, office manager, whoever it may be, please, I'm begging you. I don't care if you use my company or not. But don't be the CEO or the leadership team that says, ah, that's not my staff. Because it is. It is. So don't be that CEO. As a matter of fact... The ones that we've heard from, ah, it's not my staff, are always the worst. You guys have heard me talk about this in podcasts before. And the reason why is, is the doctors and leadership teams just kind of go, bah, that stuff's not that hard. They should be doing it at a high level. Our staff's great. Then you ask them, well, how often do you train on it? You know, they say, well, what do you mean? So, well, how often do you train on the commercial skill set to ensure your receptionist is great at a commercial job? Their job is not clinical. They work inside a clinical practice, but their job is not clinical. Matter of fact, they don't have to know anything about the clinical side of the business to be a great receptionist. That's a whole other podcast in itself. Because the doctors and leadership teams that don't agree with that, once they listen to the presentation, they always agree with it. Does it help to know the clinical side? Yeah, can't hurt. But they don't need to, but they absolutely need to know the commercial side and they don't. The things that we're talking about today, the real advanced stuff, they don't. And they don't get the ongoing training for it either. So you have to train your people. But you can't be the CEO that says, ah, that's not my people. Because it is. And whether you use my company or somebody else, you need to use somebody. I'd rather you get help from somebody that's not my company than to not use anything at all. You've got to get help on that commercial side because the people in the healthcare environment, what I've found, are not good at bragging. They're very uncomfortable when you say, look, tell me three things that makes this practice better than everybody else. And it can't be clinical. They can't do it. They're very uncomfortable doing it. It does not come naturally, which is why the role playing and practice comes in that we're going to get to later as one of the goals. Now, goal number four. What we talk about so much on this podcast is understanding today's consumer. See, today's consumer, customer service, means something different. And again, today's consumer is not just millennials. Of course, millennials are included. But as we've talked about so many times before, and you're going to hear me talk about it many times in the future, is that today's consumer is everybody. They're 70-year-olds, 6-year-olds, 50, 40. They all shop differently. They all buy differently. They all expect things to be differently. They all expect a customized approach specific to what they want, their individual needs, wants, desires, etc. And they want things quick. Which the beauty of that is it also helps your business. Because there's companies out there that 20 years ago, even 5, 10 years ago, a new patient script that basically interviewed the patient, gathered a lot of data, it worked. It doesn't work anymore. And it's inefficient for your business. Very inefficient for your business because it keeps your receptionist on the phone longer. Doing something that can be done once the patient's there. Your receptionist's job is not an interview, fill out paperwork person. Your receptionist's job just like I said before, is to ensure they're the number one marketing sales message machine of your business. They are the face of your business, the ultimate face of your business. And they have a very difficult, very difficult job. So you have to understand that today's consumer does not want you on the phone with them. Because a lot of times we talk about, we talk about when we're teaching the new patient call is look, you start with a basic script and then You customize that script based on the type practice you are because everybody's a little bit different. Some are a lot different. Some are a little bit different. But doing this for a long time, every practice has the same problems. They all think they have different problems, but they're all the same. Rarely do we come across a practice that says, ah, we have this problem and we can't figure it out. That 
four trillion other practices haven't told us in the past two decades. But there are differences in that how you have to alter and change the script based on the demographic of the type of patient you have coming in and a lot of other things as well. But today's consumer really gives you a unique advantage because if you have a script set up in a way that allows you to get on and off quickly in a trained fashion so the consumer doesn't think you're rushing them off, but trained to get on and off quickly, you are actually giving the consumer what they want. And that is going back to a five-star customer service experience. If you get on the phone, find out where they heard about you, give them a great experience, art of edification like we were just talking about, remain in control of the conversation, which these are things that we're going to be getting into today as well. Schedule them and get off the phone. You just provided an amazing experience to what a consumer wants today. And it helped your business because you got off the phone faster. It made you more efficient. Which from a CEO to CEO, for those listening out there, makes you more profitable. Efficiency defines profitability. Period. End of story. So if your receptionist is able to save 30 seconds, heck, even if they just save 5 seconds. But if they save 30 seconds on every call for the rest of their career, imagine the time that just opened up for them to do other things or to be better on the phone or to answer more phone calls that may have gone unanswered. And the list goes on and on have to understand today's consumer. Now, goal number five. Understanding, this always blows me away, guys. This just amazes me, and it will always amaze me. Can everybody please understand and agree that the consumer has choices? Do you understand that? The consumer has choices. They don't have to choose you. They also don't have to choose the person down the street. They could go into Best Buy and choose to spend $4,000 or five or whatever it may be on a flat screen TV because they have choices. And I always hear doctors say, ah, there's this new practice that opened up. They do Invisalign or, you know, they do implants. I do implants too. And they're just, they're taking my business. The last time I heard a doctor say that Best Buy, Mercedes, all these other business and consumer organizations are taking their business was never. And those are the ones that are taking more business from you than anybody. You could have 20 practices line up all in the same street. And all the other business and consumer organizations are taking more business from you than any practice ever will. Now, obviously, they're also your competition, the other practices. I'm not saying they're not. You guys have heard me talk about this before. But understand, when you add all those together, you have some serious competition that the consumer can choose to spend their disposable income on anything they want. And the thing is, is you the, the practice that opens up down the street that sells Invisalign when you do it or does implants when you do it, the beauty of it is that gives you a unique advantage is they are not a business to consumer organization that's an expert at consumers. So if you become an expert at consumers, and that's why your true competition is all the businesses that are, you know, when a person walks into Best Buy, everything is set up in a way to sell you everything. They keep stats on everything. So the next time you walk in there and everything's rearranged, they didn't just rearrange it to make it look pretty. They rearranged it with a purpose because the stats are tracked. They know exactly if the TVs are on the right side as opposed to the left, what their sales conversion is as opposed to when they're on the left. They know all that stuff. And they're able to train their people how to talk based on a ton of different stats that are tracked. You don't track those stats at your practice. A lot of them you should and you can. We're going to talk about a few of them today. And then you tailor your training based on the weaknesses of your people. But that requires you thinking like a CEO first and a doctor second. Because that's the only way you win today. Consumers view you as a commodity. So if you have the mindset of my clinical expertise is going to take me to a whole nother level, guess what? I hate to be the one that breaks the bad news to you in today's competitive marketplace. It won't. It just won't. 
It's kind of sad that it won't, but it won't. It just doesn't do it anymore. The high-level business, the practice that functions like a high-level business is the one that wins. So your receptionist has to understand the philosophy that consumers have choices. They just have choices. So therefore, your receptionist has to be great when she answers the phones. Has to be. Because the consumer is bombarded with information overload. Bombarded with information overload. So when they call your practice, they may have a Mercedes on the mind. They may have work on their mind. They may have family on their mind. They may have Facebook on their mind. Whatever it is, they may have a family vacation on their mind. What? Or they could have called three practices before you, one before you, whatever it is. Your receptionists, when they pick up the phone, have to be great. They have to be on their game at all times because they have to understand that the consumer has choices. It makes me laugh because we've been doing mystery calls for a long time. And if you're a real avid listener of this podcast, you've heard this story. But we've been doing mystery calls for so long. To practices randomly, to practices that say, hey, look, you know, just do one for us. I want to hear my people. To practices that tell us my people are great. And like I said before, those are always the ones that go the worst. Always. We've been doing them for a long time, and I to this day, and there's there's rare exceptions, and those exceptions still don't do it at the level needed. They all say the exact same thing. When a consumer on the phone says, so what's the first appointment like? Or what do you charge for a crown? Or what do you charge for Invisalign? What do you charge for whatever? Or do you take my insurance? The responses to those questions are the exact same. And to the consumer, this is what they hear. Blah, 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 I don't care. You're confusing me, I'm bored. That's what the consumer is thinking. And it's so hard to understand that. That's why it goes back to those first four goals. If you don't get that through your employee's head, through your receptionist's head, to where they truly understand what's at stake every time they pick up the phone. They cannot be great. They can be great, though, if they understand all of these things and understand the consumer has choices. And because they have a choice, if you're unable to articulate verbally why you're the choice the consumer should make, you are losing countless opportunities. And even if the consumer chooses you, this goes more for orthodontic practices out there than it does GPs. It goes more for plastic surgeons out there, which we have a lot of plastic surgeon clientele as well. It goes more for you guys because the patient, the consumer, should be ready to buy when they show up. When they show up. And that has so much to do with the first five goals we are talking about and making sure your receptionist understands and becomes an expert at all of them. Now that leads us into goal number six. Look, when we do mystery calls, when we do trainings, and this just goes for any, this is not just healthcare, this goes really for any business. You have to learn how to take the consumer down a path to your success. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen inside the healthcare environment. There's all kinds of reasons for that that we're about to get into, but it just doesn't. And it's unfortunate because it costs numerous loss opportunities. It drops the patient experience. It drops efficiencies, lowers profitability. Because you have to have a system set up in place that allows your people in this case, your receptionist, to know to start at A, which would be the greeting, and end at F, as an example, or step one through step six, and always know where to go next regardless of where the consumer tries to take it. And that allows you to provide a higher level customer service experience, allowing both sides to win. That's the reason why. But it also keeps your people doing it the same way, 
operating off of a system. Look, I'm going to start here, I'm going to end here, and here are the steps in between that are going to get me there. If the patient or the consumer says this, I know exactly where to go from there. If they say that, I know exactly where to go from there. You have to have a path to your success. It's so, so very important. And the only way you can do that, which is goal number seven, is by following a defined system. You can't have a business where people inside it do it however they want. Healthcare, more than any profession I've ever seen, lets employees run all over them. It's basically like the kids at the daycare run the show. There's an adult absent. And it drives me nuts because that's not the way you run a business, one, but it hurts not only you as a business owner and revenue and everything, but it also hurts the experience that your clientele, your patients, your customers get. There has to be a defined system for everything in your office. But today, since we're focusing mainly on the receptionist, is that there has to be a system you want followed. Has to be. We're going to go in more depth in some of these other goals about this. But without a system, it's on you. You're the CEO. We hear this all the time. Gosh, I can't get my people to follow. What's the system? I don't know. All right, well, then it's your fault. It's your leadership team's fault. It's your management team's fault. It's not your people. Because the thing is, and this is not an insult, it's not a, it's not a criticism, it is what it is, that the do- doctors listening out there, managers listening out there, most of you, not all, there's exceptions, most of you don't come with this skill set. So therefore, you don't know how to teach it. You don't know how to implement it. So you get frustrated that your staff can't do the things that they don't have qualifications and training to do. Because again, you are a commercial business that happens to have health care as what you sell. Some people just can't stand hearing that. But the facts are, because you're a doctor and you're in the mouth almost all day, you feel like the majority of the operations going on inside your practice, your business, are clinical, and they're not. Very few are. 80-90% of the practice environment is the commercial business marketing consumer type things. And explain to me what organizations that specialize in those things outside of healthcare, where did you hire your staff from? You probably didn't. You probably hired them from a dental website or Craigslist or the ones out there. So you're hiring for a position that requires commercial expertise but you're filling it with somebody that has had that expertise only from a clinical standpoint, point of view. And that all relates back to following a defined system because somebody in the practice has to make them do it. You as the CEO have to create those systems. There has to be a system for collections, a system for presenting money, a a system for overcoming price, a system for answering the new patient call. Everything, there's got to be a system with people trained to follow the system. Systems are so, so very important. And part of that system is teaching your receptionist how to take control of a conversation. This is so very important. We ask the question a lot. I have my coaches that are, you know, for our clients are using our in-house coaching program that has really become, I'm so excited because it's really, it's really become famous. The return it brings and just the feedback we're getting, it's really something that has really taken off for us. And I'm so happy because of, again, you know, obviously the revenue and stuff. I mean, in the end, we're, we're there to grow the revenue. I mean, let's not, you know, let's not beat around the bush. But we don't really focus on it because it's just so awesome getting to help staff gain the commercial skill set that they do not have. And therefore, the patients receive a better experience because consumers want that from a healthcare practice. They want the commercial things. So learning how to take control of a conversation is so, so important. Because think about it. The way the calls go in healthcare, and honestly, they go this way in almost any business, is your receptionist answers the phone, new patient group, this is Brian, how may I help you? Then the consumer asks a question. 
the receptionist then answers the question, stops, and then the consumer starts talking again. Then the receptionist does, and then the kid is that back and forth. And that back and forth takes a call that could otherwise go two or three minutes and makes it go five, six, seven, eight minutes. Simply because the consumer is in the control. And remember, I talked about walking down a path to your success. If you are not in control of a conversation, you cannot walk the consumer down the path of your success. The consumer will do that on every phone call. And that's what happens in your practice. And it happens in every other practice out there. The consumer is in control. You have to learn how to take control. There's very specific language that we teach on how to do that on the front end of the call. And it's asking. There's other methods to do it. But the main one is is asking on the front end of the call, where did you hear about us? That immediately flips the conversation because you want to be the one asking questions. The one that's asking the questions is the one that's in control. Unless it's a yes-no question. And that is the way to lose control if you ask a yes-no question. You want to form questions in the forms of statements or dual closes as much as you possibly can and eliminate any type of yes-no question there is. That's hard work, by the way. That takes a lot of practice, but it's extremely important. Taking control of the conversation by simply asking, where did you hear about us on the front end of the call? Because you think about it. Unless when you answer the call, the consumer says, I'm a patient there. Pretty much any other situation, you can use that to flip the conversation. As an example. New patient group orthodontics. This is Brian. How am I help you? Yeah, just uh, I have a 15-year-old kid and uh, just searching around for a practice that's good with Invisalign. And I wanted to see if he's a candidate. Oh, great. I can get that answer for you. So fantastic that you called us. You're going to love it here. Our doctor is amazing with 15-year-olds and just great with kids overall. You're going to get a great experience. Tell me, where'd you hear about our practice? I heard about you on Google. Great. Appreciate that information. Let's go ahead and get you scheduled. And boom, you roll right into it. See, that flipped the conversation on its head. I made it up off the top of my head here. There's a million different examples, but you get the point. I could answer that call. The consumer said, yeah, I'd like to schedule an appointment. And when they say that, they haven't identified themselves as a current patient or a new one. So all you have to do is say, great, I can get you scheduled. Where'd you hear about us? Oh, I'm already a patient there. Oh, okay, great. And then now you're in the current patient call, which is a whole other set of trainings in itself. Or they're going to say Google or billboard or referral, whatever it may be. And you get that information that you have to know to run a successful business. And that's how you take control of a conversation. Eliminate yes, no questions. Can't ask them. Form things in dual closes and then ask where did you hear about us on the front end of the call. Flip the call at the front end to make sure you're asking the questions. Now, that leads us into goal nine. Gathering and tracking critical data. Look. This is such an epidemic in healthcare and just businesses in general. Everybody in healthcare knows their new patients. Everybody in healthcare knows their production. Everybody in healthcare knows their collections. But the second you ask them what their new patient telephone call conversion is for your organization as a whole and for each individual employee, nobody knows. So you, from a CEO standpoint, are operating blind because yesterday you could have lost more opportunities for new patients by your front desk girl or guy dropping the call than you would ever get doing a postcard campaign in a month. But the thing is, and that's the difference between the finest CEOs and the ones that frankly just are not that good, is knowing the fact that you always grow an organization by fixing lost opportunities, plugging the holes in the boat, than you do going out and spending money to try to gain new ones. It doesn't matter what situation your business is in. The inside-out approach always works at higher levels. Now, as you've heard me talk about before, combining them together, meaning you're getting new opportunities while you're constantly fixing the holes in the boat, that's when 
you explode. Nobody can compete with you. And that's why it's such a unique advantage in a competitive marketplace in healthcare because healthcare practices don't do the things inside their doors well. There's exceptions, but most don't. And it gives you a very unique opportunity to be that exceptional place internally. But one of those ways is you have to know where the leaky holes are. You have to know those things. Otherwise, how do you fix them? And that's why whenever you ask, where did you hear about us? And they say Google or they say patient referral. That immediately should be recorded on a tracker next to the phone. And the calls received and calls scheduled every day should be tracked. So I just took a new patient call. I'm going to draw one. I scheduled it. I'm going to draw one. And then I'm going to write in Google. And then at the end of the day, I'm going to add them up. And I may be five for six today. Okay. Well, that's one lost opportunity. If you're an orthodontic practice, you just threw $5,000 down the toilet. Or six or seven or four, whatever you charge, you get the point. GP practice, you just lost maybe more of that over the course of time. Or who knows, maybe it was a a patient that needed an all on four or, uh, you know, an implant, crown, all the above, and Invisalign. You never know. Or it could just be a patient that you lost that could have just been a good solid patient that comes every six months for their hygiene appointment, gets the work when needed. And there are practices out there that lose three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten new patients a month. And they have no idea it's happening. Because you don't think your receptionist is going to run to you every day and go, hey, Dr. Jones, guess what? I dropped six patients this week. No. And that's why there has to be an adult in the room to make sure they're tracking it and doing it accurately. Well, how do we know it's accurate, Brian? Well, that's where the mystery calls come in. You do a mystery call. You don't tell them it's a mystery call. The person doesn't schedule. You go to their tracker for that day, and if they don't have at least one call not scheduled listed on there, I promise you there's tons of other stats that are inaccurate as well. Gathering and tracking critical data. You know, one of the things our clients love about our practice growth platform is the fact that then you just take this information and you enter it in in the proper places in the platform, and then the platform tells you all the stats that actually matter. So it actually gives you a digital output in bar graphs and pie charts and things like that on what the stats are on all your lost opportunities and employee performance, the stuff that actually matters. If you really get good at it, you don't even have to know what your production collections and new patients are. You would look at the stats that matter and you could guess it pretty close, but you can't do it the other way around. So important that your receptionists are tracking their stats on a daily basis and you as a CEO, you as a leadership team are able to oversee it both on an organization basis and on a per employee basis. So, so, so very important. Now, we talked about it earlier, learning how to stay in control. I want to reiterate this. This is goal number 10. You have to understand the difference between an open and closed-ended question. Have to understand the difference. And the facts are, asking yes-no questions. It seems like such, oh, come on, Brian, is it that big of a deal? And the answer is yes. Is it going to destroy your organization? No, none of this stuff is. But it depends on what type of organization you want to be. If you want to be a Ritz-Carlton, Walt Disney, Starbucks type organization, and I'm not talking about if you're a single practice trying to make it into 500. I'm not talking about the amount of locations they have. I mean, if you're a multi-location out there and you want to continually grow, who do you want to be? What's the image that you want to paint inside the consumer mind? Which goes back to whatever that image is, you better darn well have your receptionist and the rest of your staff trained on how to verbally articulate that image. Because if you don't, you're not going to reach that image in the mind of the consumer. It's the only chance you have. Because I can promise you a billboard is not building an image inside the consumer mind. 
postcards don't do it. Outside marketing does not build that image. Inside, internal marketing via staff verbiage does. Your verbiage too. So none of these things are going to destroy your organization, but it will destroy your organization from becoming what you want it to become if you're the type that says, look, we've got practices all over in our community. What I'm going to do is I am going to be the finest organization internally that there is. I'm going to be an innovator. I'm going to constantly come up with new ways to please my patients, train my staff, blow my consumer patients away. It will destroy it if you don't do these things because you won't be able to get it there. You just want to be the cheapest in town and do postcard campaigns saying, hey, we're the cheapest in town. We've got cheap this, cheap that, blah, blah, blah. You want to do that? That's fine. That's fine. This stuff will still help you, but this stuff isn't going to destroy you from being the cheapest in town. It will destroy you if you don't do it, if you want to be the best in town. And you want to paint that mind or paint that image in the consumer mind. The open, close-ended questions. This is something that I want you guys to go do some studying on. Because asking a yes-no question, just a simple yes-no question, can completely lose control of a conversation. It's really amazing listening to some of the mystery calls we do. When the receptionist asks that yes-no question, what happens? It literally can delay and keep you on a call for five plus minutes longer. Just with a simple yes, no question is extremely powerful. Now, verbiage, tone, and rapport. It's always amazed me how most receptionists, not all, but most receptionists, they don't smile. They don't time, they take the time to build rapport. Their tone isn't that great. Now, a lot of this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. In that the receptionist has to understand five-star customer service, marketing. The fact that every word they speak is marketing. They have to understand the consumer, what the consumer wants, all of that stuff. Because if they did, I promise you, the ones that are out there whose verbiage, tone, and rapport building is not good, it would improve instantly without any scripts. Because your verbiage means everything. That's not my opinion. It's science. It's the brain. It's the fact that I could say one thing and upset you. Somebody else could say the same thing in a different way and make you the happiest person there is. So, so very important. The verbiage has to be spot on. There's all kinds of consumer psychology stuff that we teach that we're not going to get into today. This is actually one of the longer podcasts that I even like to do because I know you guys are on the go. So we like to get on in you know, 30 minutes or an hour at the most. But verbiage, tone, and rapport building, guys, I mean, come on. You have to build rapport. You have to build rapport with everybody on the phone. You know, there's a consumer psychology principle, though, that I do want to talk about. It's called liking. It's not rocket science, but it is science, and it is psychology. People want to do business with those they like. Oh, well, gee, Brian, thanks for giving us that information. How common sense is that? Well, you're right, it is. But the problem is, is that so many people don't take the time to get you to like them. So I'm like, maybe it's not common sense. Because the facts are, like I just said, people are more likely to do business with you if they like you, regardless of what type of business you are. So a patient is going to be more likely to buy from you, refer to you, be loyal to you, show up at higher levels, follow your protocols, if they like you. So if you have a team out there that doesn't have the ability to get people to like them, guess what? You're losing opportunities. You have to have people trained. For some people, it comes natural. It's just their personality. But for others, it doesn't. And you can't be okay with, ah, you know, Susie, she's just like that. You know, we love her, though. She helps the practice. You can't be okay with that. Susie needs to be trained, if it doesn't come natural, on how to build rapport with anybody she comes in contact with. It's critically important. So, so very important. Your tone. 
You've got to sound happy. You've got to sound like you are so happy with your job, whether you are or not. And that's why a receptionist job is so hard. How would you like having a horrible day? Maybe you got to work, your husband made you mad that morning, or your wife made you mad. Or you got in a wreck, you got a ticket on the way. Whatever it may be, you may have personal issues going on, maybe all the above. And then meanwhile, you've got to answer the phone and smile and be happy. Which is, again, reiterating the importance of the receptionist understanding all those things that we talked about in the beginning. They've got to know what's at stake. They have to know all the expertise that goes into making them great on the phones. And they don't. A lot of them just consider it a job. The verbiage, tone, and rapport has to be great. Something that we get into very in-depth with our clients and, and a lot of role-playing. It's not rocket science, but in some some ways it is. Because when 99% or more of receptionists of mystery calls we've done in the past two decades, and this is our sixth year as new patient group, but the companies I've had before are also doing mystery calls and things like that. When 99 plus percent of them don't do it, it is rocket science. You know, if you said, hey, it was 99% of them do do it, well, yeah, it's common sense. But if only 1% do it, it must, be much, it must be much harder than what we're thinking. Shouldn't be hard, but it certainly must be if only 1% of the people are doing it. Goal number 12. Anytime that you're requesting something from your clientele, from your patients, the word please needs to be used before it. We're after it. As an example, your first and last name, please. Your two best contact phone numbers, please. Your email address, please. So, so very simple, but it goes into five-star customer service. If your people are not doing that, it's lowering your chances of you getting what you want Meanwhile, the consumer getting a great experience as well. And again, all these things allow you to separate yourself from your competition on what the consumer understands. The consumer is an expert at a commercial experience. They're not an expert at whether or not you're a good clinician or not. Sometimes that's very hard for clinicians to hear, but the facts are the consumer doesn't know, and they also don't care. And what I mean by that is, of course, they want a good clinician. You know, if you... if if online or on the phone, they knew they were going into the worst clinician's office ever, they wouldn't go. So that's not what I'm saying. But the point is, is it always goes back to, and that's what it's just the way it is today. You could be the worst tea straightener on the planet. You could be, you could put the worst crown in my mouth. But if I got a great commercial experience and you didn't hurt me, I don't know if the crown's good or not. I just don't. You could be a bad tea straightener, bad orthodontist, but if I got a great experience, you didn't hurt me, I love the staff, I love you, you're a great salesperson, fell in love with you, I'm buying from you. It's just the way it is. So all of these things internally, talking about the phones today, is why people will buy from you at much higher levels and also how your receptionist needs to set them up to buy from you and be excited for, to buy from you day one. And these little things are what makes it happen because nobody else in healthcare is saying, please, you will. They may do it on a one-off basis, but consistently their whole staff, no. So when you ask for something, you need to follow it with please. So simple, at the same time, so difficult because there's a lot of training because, again, you've got to embed it in your mind of your staff. Then, once they give it to you, you need to say thank you. Your first and last name, please. Yeah, it's Brian, right? Well, thank you for that information. Your two best contact phone numbers, please. Well, it's 713 and, and 813. Okay, thank you for that information as well. Just like that. And you also need to say, you're welcome. It 
Sounds like no-brainers, doesn't it, guys? Isn't it amazing sometimes, some of these things? But again, if you really analyze and think about your staff, are they doing these things? And I can tell you they're not. I've been doing this long enough to know they're not. But they can with training. And remember, we've talked about this in a competitive marketplace. The more competition there is, the harder it is to win on price. Because more and more people can be cheaper than you. You can never be the cheapest. That's very hard to do. Very hard to do. But you always can be the best. You always can offer the most value. You always can have the nicest staff. You can always be trained in a way internally that your competition isn't. And that's why in a competitive marketplace, the Ritz-Carlton, Starbucks, Walt Disney, it's why they destroy everybody. They do the things internally that nobody else will. They don't have the mentality of, ah, oh, we don't need the internal stuff. We just need to get our name out there in postcards. It's not the way they think. And again, that's what we're all about, is teaching the ways of the top 1%. Teaching the ways of the top 1% in the commercial world. Teaching that to the healthcare world. It's what we're all about. It's probably why we're one of the few companies in healthcare that help practices grow that also have a client base outside of healthcare. We've had publicly traded companies, restaurants. We've trained them on a lot of the same philosophies that we train our healthcare clients on. It's the ways of the top 1%. What's proven to grow a business and beat competition at the highest levels that few people will commit to doing. And please, thank you and you're welcome are part of a small piece of a big puzzle. If you take one piece out, does it hurt the organization? Eh, doesn't help it, but it doesn't hurt it, doesn't destroy it. But as you take these pieces one by one out you're left with no puzzle you're left with nothing left and that's when it really destroys an organization so please thank you and you're welcome now I was talking with one of my employees the other day and I told him like look because we're listening to a mystery call together and it was a newer employee that we brought aboard we're having a conversation about it, and I turned to him and said, look, this, you can always tell what the management team and or the doctor told the receptionist about how to handle over, uh, how to handle price increase, how to overcome them. You can always tell. Because two things happen. Two. There's not a third. 100% of the calls we've ever done. So this includes your practice if you're listening. 100%. Two things happen. That either the price is quoted. How much do you guys charge for Invisalign? We charge $4,900 or $5,000 or $6,000. It somewhat depends on the case, the complexity, how many trays, longevity, how many years. But it's right in the $4,900 to $5,500 range. Boom, you automatically lost. You can't win that way. What image does that build in my head? No image of value. And now, if the guy down the street beats it, you lost me. I'm going there instead. So it's a surefire way of losing it. There's a way, actually, to do it that we teach via low monthly payments, but that's a whole other podcast in itself. Don't want to get into it today. The other one is, the receptionist says, we don't quote prices over the phone or we need to get you in. Or we're not allowed to quote prices. So you know that the management team just told the receptionist, hey, we don't quote prices over the phone and that's where the training stopped. Somehow the receptionist is supposed to amazingly know how to answer that question when they've been told by their management, their superiors, to not answer the question. Those are the two scenarios that come up and both are surefire ways to lose. So you have to know how to overcome price inquiries. And everything we're talking about today actually goes into it. We teach a very specific three-step process on how to overcome price inquiries. And 
it, it's funny because it works at such a high level, it's scary. But so many people still fight it. Because it's answering the question without answering the question. You don't tell them no. You don't use any negative connotation words. Nothing like that. You answer it without answering it. And it works so well. You people have to understand how to overcome price increase. Have to. If you're listening right now and you don't train your receptionist and have them work on their skill set at least once a month, that would be the worst case scenario. It should be once every week. If they don't role play how to best overcome price increase on a consistent monthly basis, you are losing thousands of dollars over the course of your career. And the better your digital presence the better your search rankings, the better your Google Maps rankings. Other digital presence as well. The better that is, the more shoppers you're going to get because when they type it in, you come up, they call you and they say, look, do you do Invisalign? Yeah, we do Invisalign. How much do you charge? That's what you get. And if you're a practice that doesn't get that, your digital presence, it's an instant indicator that your digital presence is not where it should be. Because internet shoppers ask price questions. They have more objections. They ask insurance, which is another thing. You've got to understand how to overcome insurance increase, questions, objections, etc. So don't be the doctor that doesn't make sure your team is trained on an ongoing basis to know how to handle that stuff. They have to know that stuff. Have to. Have to. Goal number 14. Guys. You've heard me say it a million times. Practice makes perfect. But then you have to take what you're working on and implement it. You're better off focusing on one thing for the rest of 2018. One. And getting it implemented at a high level. And ensuring accountability takes place to make sure your staff, your people know that it's expected to be done at a high level and they will be held accountable for keeping it at a high level. Then you are doing 50 things and never becoming good at any of them. You have to practice, you have to implement, and you have to hold people accountable. There's got to be an adult in the room. So if you want your receptionist to be great, The only way that will ever happen is with what I just said. They need to practice consistently. Even if it's the same thing they did yesterday, do it again. Even if it's the same thing you've done 50 times before in their career, do it again. Practice makes perfect. That helps you implement and make sure it remains implemented. But that's not where it ends. There has to be an adult in the room to hold your people accountable at the highest levels to where you know as an organization your people understand that they are expected to be great at all times. It's inexcusable if they're not. That's the type of organization you want to run. Have an adult in the room. And lastly... This amazes me. I've never had anybody disagree with this in my career. And part of this is just, you know, sometimes you need an outsider's perspective on how to best grow an organization. You don't need a full-fledged call center, but this is whether you're one practice or you have a million. If you have a million, you need a call center. (laughs) But if you're a smaller organization, this goes for you as well. Where is the last place in the world it makes sense to have somebody answer the phones? You nailed it. It's up front. It's where all practices almost have them answer the phones. It is literally the dumbest place you could ever possibly imagine putting a receptionist. Phones are ringing. Somebody's waiting to check out. There's stacks of paper on the desk. The door chimer's going off. You have three people in the waiting room. You have a kid running around. You have people wanting to ask you questions. Meanwhile, you're expected to do everything I'm talking about today and more at a high five-star level. Overcome questions. 
handling complaints. Staying in control, giving great customer service, being efficient. List goes on and on. How do you do that in converted high levels with all that stuff going on up front? So if any possible, and don't have the minds of how we can't do that because you can. Very few practices have I ever stepped foot in that there isn't a place that you could take your receptionist and move them to. Answer the phones anywhere but the front. The front is the worst possible place you could put this position and expect it to be great. Anywhere but the front. And if you really think hard, you can think of a place to do it. 15 goals, guys. You accomplish those 15 things at high levels in your organization. You are going to convert at higher levels you're going to give a great experience because you're installing the commercial skill sets into the mind of your people, making them think, giving them a better sense of pride for their job, teaching them sales fundamentals, five-star customer service, efficiency techniques, time management, multitasking, the list goes on and on. You take these 15 goals, and I, no, I, I didn't go into depth about all of them, some of them, honestly, you could take probably seven or eight of them. They could be a podcast in, their self, in itself. But these 15 can really take your organization to an entirely different level, but it all goes back to management. If there's not an adult in the room to make sure everything I'm talking about gets implemented, good luck. If you're the doctor that thinks they can just be in the mouth all day and have no idea what else is going on, someone's just going to report it to you, good luck. You have to have the adult in the room that's going to ensure all these things are implemented. Has to happen. Has to happen. I hope you guys enjoyed it today. It's been a while, like I said, since been in the broadcast booth. So I wanted to make today's a little bit longer than normal. Give you guys as much information to think about what we do. Making sure you're thinking differently than the guy down the street. Appreciate you guys listening. Appreciate all the loyalty out there and the great things that are being said about the podcast. Remember, check out our new website, a new patient group. We launched a new website recently. Uh, it's newpatientgroup.com. A lot of cool things on there. Uh, we have this uh, new tab. It's called the Learning Center. And under that, we just have a lot of stuff. We have, you know, we have a live webinar the third Friday of every month at 11 a.m. Central. And that's open to anybody that wants to show up. Uh, so there's a webinar registration page that explains what that, re- you know, the keynote speaker, what it's going to be about. You can register right there. Then there's all kinds of webinars you can watch on our site Uh, that just gives you great, valuable information that you could take back to your practice and help it grow. So go check it out, and I'd love to know the feedback. And this coming Friday, uh, excuse me, it's the third Friday this month. Got ahead of myself a little bit. John White's doing uh, the podcast. It's Dr. John White. He's the leading Invisalign producer in the state of Ohio. He's doing the live webinar, and he's going to be talking about branding and how to best position your practice for the future success, something he's very good at. Uh, he's been a loyal client now for, for quite some time. So looking forward to Dr. White's presentation. And remember, just go to the site. You can register there. Thanks for listening, everybody. You guys have a great day. We'll talk to everybody soon. Bye-bye.